Building work, normally the enemy of wildlife, but could a new law in the new year make it nature's friend? We're promised hundreds of thousands of new homes alongside more business development every year in Britain. But what does all this building mean for our wildlife? Well, a new law coming in in the new year suggests we can have both more building and more nature. But will it work? Also on the show... As lifelong environmentalist King Charles announces the government's plans for new oil and gas exploration in the North Sea, is the UK an outlier in extracting more fossil fuel? I meet the methane police and hear how they scour satellite data to solve major pollution incidents. And we hear why a farmer has switched to growing bulrushes in this soggy field near Manchester and why it could keep you warm in future winters. From January, new building developments in England will have to deliver a 10% benefit for nature. It's called biodiversity net gain. New homes for us often come at the expense of living space for wildlife. But from the new year, a new law in England means developers will have to make sure their products deliver 10% more nature. It's called biodiversity net gain. We've got a nature pond beside us. It used to be a, an old fishing lake, but we've enhanced it. And now it's got lots of birds coming to visit it every day. Um, I, I'll take, I can actually see that. You know, we've had swans there. I can see more hens. We've had cormorants drying out their yeah. wings. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a really busy place for, for, for uh, birds now, uh, as well as people. Here in Aylesbury, a new housing estate is being shown as an example of biodiverse building in action. It'll have 2,100 houses and provide more natural habitat than the farmed fields they are built on. It's delivered here with a mixture of dedicated nature zones and tweaks to the newly built environment. We've got the house martin nesting cups, which are on the front end of our building oh, okay. here. Yeah, We've yeah. got swift nesting bricks, which go into the fabric of the, the building, same size as a brick, and it fits in really neatly. We've also installed hedgehog highways, which are simple little holes underneath fences in people's back gardens, giving hedgehogs a much wider expanse of garden to roam in. Well, I think what we're going to see is a lot more developments like this in the future. New builds are really going to have to start to incorporate some of these benefits for wildlife into their fabric. So just to recap, here's how this biodiversity net gain works. You assess the natural value of the land before you build the estate, say like a farmer's field. And then you put your houses in, no architecture awards here, and you try and improve the natural value within that footprint. You might, for instance, put in a pond or a wildflower area. But you might find you can't do enough for nature actually within the new estate itself and then you are allowed to offset nature by creating, say, a woodland or a wildflower meadow elsewhere. Overall, the total nature has to be enhanced by at least 10%. That's what will happen to this rather barren-looking field a few miles from Milton Keynes. In a few years, with money from developers, it should resemble this natural nirvana. So at the moment we've just drilled the last barley crop. It will grow to become the final harvest before this 38 hectares is transformed. And these fields are going to be species rich meadows, full, bursting with life, bursting with beautiful wildflowers, buzzing with insects. Um, we're going to have a big area of scrub planting, which sounds unusual, but it's also fantastic for wildlife. So you're painting a picture of, I don't know, something you'd want to skip through. <laughs> and nature loves it as well. So much skipping going on, <laughs> yeah. So this is where the new habitat will be created. But this place hasn't been chosen at random. It links a newly planted woodland over there with an ancient woodland behind me, adding up to a really nice big habitat. How well policed will schemes like this be, well enforced? Or will it be just, you know, plant a few saplings, pocket the money and walk away? 
We undertake surveys annually to make sure that what we've promised on the ground is actually happening and then we report back to the local planning authorities to tell them how it's going and if things aren't quite going to plan we can adjust what we do on the land to make sure that all of those commitments that we've made on behalf of a developer um, actually happen. Conservation groups are giving biodiversity net gain a cautious welcome. They like the idea but fear it lacks the human and financial resources to deliver it effectively, especially in local authority planning departments. Local authorities will be responsible uh, overall for the, yeah, the overall outcomes of biodiversity net gain delivered in the, in, within their local authority uh, and their contribution towards government goals and targets. Uh, so they, they ultimately hold a, a great deal of responsibility. And so it's completely essential that they have the resources to be able to do their job, the resources and the mechanisms, you know, credible monitoring and enforcement mechanisms to be able to do their job. And our real worry is that, you know, that they don't have the resources to do those things at the moment. Will this help to protect and preferably enhance nature? So it gets us some way towards our goals. But um, with the current institutional setup that we have right now, I do not believe it will achieve an, a net gain in biodiversity. And it requires some serious reforms and improvements to deliver on that promise. It's one tool in the toolbox for nature recovery in the country. Let's not pretend it's going to fix all of our problems, but it's one really positive tool in the toolbox. With both the government and the Labour Party promising hundreds of thousands of new homes, forging development and wildlife to be allies, not enemies, will be key to a nature recovery. Now, sticking with upcoming legislation, King Charles delivered his first King's speech this week. The traditional opening of Parliament, where the monarch lays out the government's plans for the year ahead. And as a lifelong environmentalist, he'd be forgiven for having a bit of a lump in his throat as he announced plans for further oil exploration in the North Sea. This bill will support the future licensing of new oil and gas fields. The government says it will improve security of supply and help the transition to net zero, but many energy analysts disagree. When it comes to energy independence, actually the Climate Change Committee, the International Energy Agency, they've said that the best way to get energy independence is to reduce our gas demand in the first place. Things like insulation, moving away from gas boilers, more renewables, rather than more oil and gas, which is basically going to be sold on the open market anyway. And while the government backs more drilling, temperatures continue to rise, with last month now confirmed as the hottest October ever recorded, almost half a degree hotter than the previous record set four years ago. 2023 is now all but certain to be the hottest year ever. All of this has led to the deputy head of the EU's Climate Change Service saying that the urgency for ambitious climate action going into COP28 has never been higher. So what does urgent action look like? The so-called High Ambition Coalition, an informal group of countries pushing for stronger measures at these UN climate summits, released a pre-COP statement calling for a phase-out of fossil fuel production. It's been signed by the likes of France, Spain, Ireland and the Netherlands, but not, notably, the UK, previously an active member. The government says it will continue to play a leading role at COP28, including within the High Ambition Coalition. But this could all prove to be a little awkward for our green-minded king as he prepares to deliver the opening address at COP28 in Dubai in just a few weeks' time. But is the UK really an outlier in this? A report from the United Nations suggests possibly not as it reveals that plans for oil, gas and coal production across the world are nearly double what is compatible with the Paris Agreement. Well, one of the authors of the report, Ploy Achakal Wizout, joins me now. Ploy, what does your report show? We estimate that at a global level, such plans and projections, when taken together, would altogether lead to double the levels of fossil fuel production that would be consistent with limiting long-term warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius as agreed upon under the Paris Agreement by all governments worldwide. We profile 20 major fossil fuel producers in our report and then derive a global estimate um, based on um, their national energy outlooks and strategies. But the, the major countries we focus on include the UK, the US, China, 
um, the, the UAE, who will be hosting COP28 and other major producers. Are they one of the countries that's actually planning to drill for more oil and gas th- than they should be if they're going to meet these targets? Yeah, so according to the plans we assessed with the UAE, um, they foresee increasing domestic oil and gas production out until around 2030. Obviously, climate change is a collective problem. We don't just single out any individual country in our report. But altogether, we we urge especially high-income governments to help lead this global transition. Where does the UK fit into this? Because we've just seen announcements to allow more drilling in the North Sea. Yeah, I mean, the UK was one of the first countries in the world to enshrine its net zero commitments into law. And so in many ways, it it sort of can be viewed as a climate leader. But in our analysis, when we look at the UK, we don't find evidence that they're committing or accepting that we need to reduce the global production and consumption of coal, oil and gas in line in order to achieve 1.5 degrees C. And when you think about the issue of historical responsibility as well, I think the UK should help lead this transition. I was just wondering how your report fits with the International Energy Agency's recent report that said fossil fuels will peak this decade, will peak before 2030. Do these two reports kind of fit together or do they argue with each other? We specifically focus on production targets and outlooks. And so this means that such targets being set by governments, often by ministries of energies or resources and mining, are not even in alignment with um, demand outlooks. Could it be the case that if demand goes down, and that might be pushed down by cheaper renewables or other things that are competing with fossil fuels, that this production scenario may not happen? Yeah, that's a great point. And it's true. Um, So actual production in the future might be slightly lower than what's estimated in our report if they were to adjust them to align with expected demand. But I think the really crucial point is that market forces alone is not going to phase out fossil fuels rapidly enough. So yes, it's going to be an uphill battle, but the science demands that we phase out fossil fuels beginning now. Well, thanks very much indeed, Ploy. Well, we're off to a break now, but when we come back, we'll be talking to the methane police tracking down that very potent greenhouse gas and also looking at an ethical alternative to down for filling your winter coat, all in the name of restoring peat bogs. Welcome back to the show. Earlier, we were speaking about what's needed at the upcoming COP28 climate summit. And one of the things they'll be looking at is methane. The gas is responsible for about a quarter of the planet's warming to date, and it often leaks from oil and gas infrastructure. These can sometimes be called super-emitting events. Well, recently, the UN has set up a sort of methane police force. It's called the IMEO, and I'm delighted to say that the boss of it, Manfredi Caldagirone, joins me now, and I'm also going to be speaking to Itzia Irakulis, who is, if you like, one of the detectives actually studying what's happening down on the ground. Before we get into the details of how you're tackling methane, why is it important? Well, methane is the second largest contributor to to climate change after CO2 and is deemed responsible for in between 30 and 40 percent of the global warming we're experiencing today. Also, the the characteristics of methane, the fact that it's very potent in increasing global warming, but it stays in the atmosphere very shortly, makes it interesting because if we can reduce emissions in the short term, we can really turn down the thermostat and buy us time. The science tells us we need to reduce uh, methane between 40 and 45 percent in the next 74 months. So we need to be really targeted. So between now and 2030. That's really fast, isn't it? I mean, that, that, that's a steep decline. It is. It is. And so to, to reach this high level of, of reduction, we really need to, do, to know where the emissions come from, how much is emitted where, and critically, how emission change over time so that we can adjust uh, our policies and, and our action to, uh, to really tackle the problem uh, to, the, to the deepness that the science uh, requires us to. And we're going to talk to your detective, if you like, while we're styling you as the, the chief constable. But more, more or less, how do you go about seeing and discovering these, these methane emissions? 
there is a variety of methods and satellites is just one of the many tools that uh, the that, that science community is using and that uh, UNEP through the International Meter Emissions Observatory is trying to operationalize and make available to the uh, to the broader public. Thank you very much, Manfredi. Well, as I mentioned earlier, Manfredi is, if you like, the boss, but we want to talk to some of the detectives. I was going to say detectives on the ground, but this is a little bit more eye in the sky, a lot of satellite work happening here. And I'm joined by one of his team, who is Itzia Irakulis. Itzia, tell me, how do you go about finding the people who are emitting methane? We use high-resolution satellite data that are uh, satellite data with very small pixel size. Uh, and we scan this area with higher concentration of methane. And this way we can start uh, looking like a smaller plumes coming from specific facilities. And does it look like a, a colour on your screen? I know that's artificial, but do you get a sort of big plume of a certain, a certain shade? Yes, well, uh, what we do is um, apply a color ramp and depending the concentration per pixel, uh, we can see where is the highest concentration starting from yellow with a higher value of, of methane uh, to green and then uh, blue. And this way I can see visually when it starts, when there are the highest value. I mean, this is critical detective work in terms of climate change, isn't it? I mean, this is really important. So I, I'm guessing it's pretty exciting when you find an emitter. It is, well... Mainly because until now it was like, okay, I was here in, in my laboratory checking uh, satellite data, applying different methodologies and, method and different uh, algorithms. Now uh, we can make it actionable and, and we can stop it. So this is yeah. very exciting. Have you made some big or perhaps shocking discoveries while you've been doing this? I would say that the most exciting um, cases are always coming from those uh, where uh, if it's an oil and gas uh, facility, for example, when they don't know, really don't know that this is going on and you contact them and, and then they start taking action and, and fixing. Uh, and once you see this case of you are seeing emissions, you have reported and they are taking action to fix it, this is the m most exciting thing because, well, your methodology is, is working. <laughs> It's here, Iraklis. Thank you very much indeed. I look forward to hearing some of the details uh, later on this year at, at the COP Summit. But for now, thank you. Thank you. Well, winter is coming up and that makes us think of warm clothing. Often the warmest is filled with feathers down. But could there be a vegetarian alternative, if you like? Well, our own Mickey Carroll has been to Manchester and seen something growing in a soggy field, which could be a more ethical stuffing. This story ends on the catwalk, but, like lots of things, it starts in soil. Much of the land outside Salford was once marsh, an area so swampy and unusable that 300 years ago Daniel Defoe called it a land that is entirely waste. Over time, almost all of Greater Manchester's peatlands were drained to make way for farming. Steve's granddad hand-laid pipes and drains in order to make the land workable. But the bog is trying to creep back in. The land is becoming too wet for conventional farming. You look at these fields around here, they're just saturated at the moment. So it's a short period of time where you can get a crop in and get it out. And it seems to be getting shorter and shorter. Steve is taking radical action. He's working with the Wildlife Trust to turn at least some of his land back into peat bog, a process called re-wetting. We're literally excavating fields to wet the field up now, which doesn't take much around here. Once the land is restored, Steve will be doing what he does best, farming crops on it. Specifically, bulrushes, which grow natively in marshes and will help keep the farm profitable. Did you ever imagine you'd be farming bulrushes? No, never. <laughs> no, never. What's happening here hasn't happened at this scale before. This is six hectares of drained peatland being restored to what it was more than 80 years ago. From an environmental point of view, it's all about saving carbon. Peat is really good at storing carbon. But from a farming point of view, it means that Steve can still make money by selling crops that grow natively in these kind of conditions. But what's really attention-grabbing is where those bulrushes will be going. This is Biopuff Looseville, which um, is equivalent to sort of goose or duck down feathers. Steve's crop will be used by a company called Saltico, who are stuffing down jackets with bulrush heads. 
And what we do is we extract the fluffy seed fibers, which you get from inside um, bulrush heads, and we turn it into a high quality fiber insulation to keep us nice and warm and dry in these puffer jackets. Approximately a billion insulated jackets will be made and sold in 2023, so Julian is convinced that he can make this worthwhile for farmers. But bulrushes aren't the only peatland plant he's got his eye on. We see this expanding out to other plants as well, because what's really important with uh, a regenerative agricultural system is not just creating more monocultures, but being able to create permacultural systems where we grow plants next to each other. Around 3% of the UK's farming emissions come from drained peatland, so restoring these environments could have a massive impact. But that's impossible if farmers aren't brought along with it. We need to work with farmers, and it's not a kind of, you know, the traditionalism them, you know, isn't there anymore. And the farmers that we're working with across our area, uh, you know, we're trying to understand their, their needs and actually fit around ways that we can, you know, switch to a more environmentally sustainable way of farming, but that doesn't actually affect their livelihoods. And that's what we're trying to do with this project. The hopes are that this project will be the first of many. Maybe we'll soon all be wearing clothes made of peaty plants. Mickey Carroll, Sky News. Well, that's it for this week. Remember, you can catch up on all your climate and environment news on the Sky News website and app, or by scanning the QR code on your screen right now. And in case you're wondering why I'm here, it's because next week we'll be all at sea looking at the pollution from shipping and Portsmouth's plans to be net zero by 2030. Yeah.